Turn to Psalm 112 and 1 Timothy 6. Psalm 112, 1 Timothy 6. We're continuing today on our topic about money. All right? Uh, here at Houston Faith Church, we do talk about money because God in the Bible talks about money. Uh, some places say you ought not talk about money because people don't want to hear that. And the reason I'll tell you people don't want to hear about money is because it's important to them. And it's precious to them. And they would rather God nor the preacher nor anybody else talk about them and their money. It's a private matter. Well, God wants to get right in the middle of your private matters, doesn't he? And so we need to let him. Uh, more in the Bible is said about money than is said about heaven and hell. God wants to make sure His people, His children, He wants to make sure every Christian, every believer knows how to do money right in this earth. Yes. Right? Yes. And so we've been spending several weeks on this, covering all the links in the chain to connect to the, pro the, 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 the covenant of prosperity with God. We have to have the principles right. right. We have to have principles active in our life in order to be prosperous God's way. Amen. Now, when we say prosperous, we're not just talking about uh, multi-rich or uber-rich. We're not talking about being millionaires, though some could. We're talking about always having plenty, always having enough, always having a full supply. Whatever Amen. place you're at, always having enough and then some. Amen. And then some to give to the church, some to give to the poor, some to give to your friends, some to put in savings, some to set up for retirement, some for the college fund. We're talking about always having plenty, no matter what level you're at. Yes. All right? And so there's a way to get there, but it requires principled living. Amen. Now, we've been through the principles. I'll run through them real quick. Number one, you have to work. Amen. No laying on the couch quoting Scripture without a job. <laughs> Number two, you have to develop a prosperous soul. You have to get prosperous on the inside. You have to understand God and His will for you and His abundant provision for you as Jehovah. So inside, you have to feel like your Heavenly Father's got it covered. Yes. Yes. Number three, you have to be a giver. Yes. Being, a, being a giver is an attribute of all real Christians. Amen. Amen. There is He who uh, distributes and yet He increases. Right. Yet there's He who scatters and still increases. Gives us stuff and He's still increasing. Yes. And then it says there's He that withholds more than He should and it tends to poverty. No hoarding, no greediness. We're givers, we're unselfish, and that's the nature of a Christian. Amen. Number four is do not worry. Jesus said, don't you dare worry about your basic necessities. You're better than flowers, better than birds. Do not worry and do not take any thought for tomorrow, saying, well, what are we going to eat? How are we going to pay the bills? How are we going to make the money? Right. Don't even think it, don't even say it. Do not worry. If you worry, you take yourself right out of the blessing of covenant prosperity with God. All right. Sometimes people done all sorts of good stuff, but they're still worried. And so there's a hole in the bucket. And so we're plugging people's holes in the bucket. Can't you imagine that God's not so willing to give you more in your bucket if you got holes in your bucket? Each principle plugs a hole. All right. Number five is the Christian must develop a habit of saving and investing. He that gathers little by little shall be increased. Yes. Wealth gotten quickly or by vanity shall be diminished. Yes. So Christians, your retirement plan, your future plan is not to get rich quick. It's not a ship. My ship's going to come in one day. I just know it. <laughs> no, it's not. I'll just tell you now. No, it's not. And even if it did, you have to live by principle today. Some people thought, you know, years ago that Jesus is coming soon. Why save money? So they sold all their stuff. They, they got in this other thing and thought they were living by faith. And what they were really doing was living by presumption. Jesus didn't come. Now they're retired and they have no money. If Jesus was coming in two years, I say still start a savings plan. Amen. Why? Because it's right. It's a principle of God yeah. to gather little by little. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Number six is what we're starting today, or we're continuing from last week. The sixth key, the sixth plug in the bucket is reap by faith. You have to learn how to harvest by faith. And the premise is this. <clears throat> We've majored, the church at large has majored to some degree on seed planting. 
Sow your seed. Every offering time, sow your seed. We, we, we understand that. It's a right principle. Sow your seed. Give. Plant seed in the kingdom of God. Every time you put money in the bucket, that seed into the kingdom of God, which is a very real place inside your heart. And in that kingdom of God is, is supposed to be a harvest. Amen. But I've noticed that so many times Christians have, uh, they look back in their past and it's like, man, I've planted all this seed. Where's my harvest? Yeah. And the reason is because they got harvest. I mean, the seed you plant, it grows. Mm -hmm. They just haven't realized that they're going to have to put the sickle in and reap that harvest by faith. Amen. Harvest doesn't just show up on the table. You have to go out in the field with that sickle or that tractor and that combine. You have to put labor in to get your harvest. So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, let me read these two scriptures, though, just to keep us in the middle of the road. You don't ever want to get in the ditch on things, okay? So the middle of the road is this. Psalm 112 reads this. There's been some that said, uh, you know, spiritual people aren't rich and don't need to be. Spiritual people aren't wealthy and don't really need to be. We're, we're the spiritual ones. Then there's others that say the wealthy people aren't spiritual and don't need to be. No, that's not true. Neither one of those are true. Everybody ought to be spiritual. Amen. Everybody ought to be spiritual whether you're wealthy or not. And then you ought to live up to the grace of God no matter what state you're in, no matter what level you're at. You ought to live up to the grace of God and receive all that you can under the faith and grace of God that you've got. Amen. And then stretch yourself so that you're always increasing. Amen. I'm glad you're all enthused Amen. about that. Amen. Maybe you will be after I read this. <laughs> Psalm 112 says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in His commandments. Is that you? Yeah. 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 Are you happy to read the commands of God? Yeah. When, when you read a command that says, Thou shalt not, does it make you happy? Yeah. <laughs> when you read a command that says, Thou shalt, or do, does it make you happy? Yeah, yeah. yeah the Word of God, even, even the correctional part is supposed to make us happy. Amen. That's right. So I delight greatly in the commandments of God. What, a, what an honor to not be left on earth Alone. I know how to live. I've got my father. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. Notice, the man who fears the Lord and delights in his commandments, wealth and riches are in his house. Praise God. Amen. All right, so this kind of uh, gives us a glimpse into God's will for people. His plan has always been to bless His people immensely. Amen. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Here's the other side of the ditch or of the road. 1 Timothy chapter 6, because what's happened is we found out God wanted us to prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. Yes. Uh, and then we started thinking, well, that would be re that's really wonderful. I think I'll just go ahead and get rich. I would love to be rich. How many of you would like to be rich? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> it's a trick question, but here's why I say that. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But you, O man of God, flee these things. Notice it says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Yes. So what you and I have to do is, and this is, a, this is an art Okay, in the Christian life, this is an art in receiving from God. It's disconnecting something that can be seen from something that can't be seen. Uh, it's disconnecting from uh, pursuing money, though knowing money should be there. So as we said before, you know, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things are added to you. So you have to disconnect. Though we know that every righteous one who walks with God by faith and understands these things and follows these principles, assimilates this stuff into their life, everyone who does 
will have a full supply and lots of wealth and plenty left over. We know that, but don't start pursuing the wealth. Pursue God, look only unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and let the wealth come. Let God add into our bosom. Let all that happen passively rather than chasing after riches. So many people have got it in their heart and started yearning to be richer. And ri the poor want to be richer. The rich don't want to lose it. And, and really, the truth is, no matter how rich you get, you're going to want more. The natural man is never satisfied. The eyes of man are never satisfied. The natural man could be a multimillionaire. And, you know, somebody asked a millionaire, do you think you're rich? He goes, no, not really. They said, how much more would you need to, to, be, to feel rich? He said, a little bit more. So don't get caught in the trap. You, you, you fall into temptation and a snare. All right. So there's our balance. Are you ready? Yeah. So the key number six, or link number six, is learn how to reap by faith. Uh, turn with me to Mark chapter 11, if you would, please. I want to reiterate something from last week. We... If, if the kingdom is as if a man should cast seed into the ground, then every time you plant seed into the kingdom, every time you sow money, then you should have a crop begin to grow. And if you think about it, our history should turn out to be thousands of acres of property with many different harvest fields growing at different levels. Stuff I planted a long time ago is ready for harvest. Stuff I just planted is just now seedlings. But if you just look in the Spirit and you see, i got crops everywhere. I've, I've, I've never missed a season of sowing. I've never missed a month of giving. If you missed a month of giving, then that field is empty. And that's where many Christians find themselves in financial difficulties. Always up and down and up and down. It's because they've got seasons of... Uh, no seed. Anytime you plan a season of no seed, you're scheduling a season of lack in the future. But if we've done it right, we've got harvest at all different levels, man. And if I need some extra harvest, I just go to the one that's right and get it. Hallelujah. Sometimes it seems like you planted seed, it didn't come up. I think with the eye of faith, you can look in there and see that it did come up. But sometimes people plant seed, then they do weird things that mess up their seed. Right? Now, seed planting could be all sorts of things. The way you talk, the way you live, uh, the mercy you showed, that could be a seed. The forgiveness you showed to someone else, you can reap a harvest. God said He's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will He also reap. Yeah. But it also includes anything, whatever. So we, right now we're targeting the money side of sowing and reaping. All right? So we have a harvest out there of money, or we should. If, you're, if it seems like you planted seed that didn't come up, because that could happen. You know, you ever took a little peach seed or a little watermelon seed, and you thought, oh, I'm going to look at all these watermelon seeds. I'm just going to throw them in the ground and get some watermelons. It doesn't always come up. Weird things could happen to your seed, but if what you sowed was good seed with a right heart, with the right motives, good seed doesn't die. So it will come up. You might need to change the way you're talking. You might need to change your expectancy. You might need to flip the switch of faith on. You might do to, need to add some principles here and learn how to reap by faith, but it will come up. They, they've talked about the Chinese uh, bamboo tree, and this is what seems to be the truth about it. Anybody ever heard of the Chinese bamboo? It's some special tree that um, if you, when you plant it, plant it, nothing comes up. And, and the next week and the next and the next month and the next and the next year and the next, nothing comes up. For five years, you see no, no, no sign and no evidence that that thing's alive. And that's what happens sometimes to the seed we sow. It just gets discouraging. It's like, oh, they said I was supposed to get a harvest off my seed. And you just kind of get natural and it's like, oh, well, I guess nothing happened there, you know. But that Chinese bamboo thing, for five years, there's no growth on the top. Uh... But all that five years, there's stuff happening on the inside, underneath the ground. And within 90 days, within 90 days, is it 90 days? Excuse me, it's in six weeks, that tree grows 90 feet. Within six weeks, that tree grows 90 feet. Six weeks grows 90 feet. I mean, that's exceptional harvest, isn't it? I mean, that's, whoa, 
What has happened here? You need some of those, don't you? <laughs> well, if you'll just have some faith that the seed you planted is growing, you can have some of those. Hallelujah. We don't live off of those, but you can have some of those. So just remember, good seed doesn't die. Stuff's happening on the inside. Go to Mark chapter 11 real fast. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. This is when Jesus cursed the fig tree. It says, Now the next day when they came from Bethany, Jesus, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. So they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went to the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. We'll skip that for a moment. Recognize what happened, though. He, he said something to the tree, and, and nobody really saw anything. Yeah. Skip down to verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. So nothing happened till the next day. Jesus spoke something, he said something that only caused action in the unseen realm. So when you confess a scripture, when you command a thing by faith, you might not see something immediately. I mean, it might take at least 24 hours. But they saw it dried up from the roots. The roots is what, where everything starts. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. Jesus had had faith in God. Uh, notice that it's underneath. It's the unseen. And if you can curse something and it starts at the roots, you can also start something. You can also bless something. You can get your finances headed the right direction right now. But you might not see anything tomorrow. All right? But you have to realize spiritual things matter, spiritual things work, life and death are in the power of the tongue. What you say always matters. Amen. Verse 22, Jesus said, have faith in God. And then he gives us an example of having faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Notice what... Let's, let's define this. What is the guy going to have? What is his faith supposed to be in? Whatever he says. Notice it doesn't, it doesn't say have faith that the mountain will move. It says believes that those things he says will come to pass. So here's a question for you and I. Do you believe that what you say will come to pass? Do you believe that what you say will come to pass? Do you believe that what you say will come to pass? Oh, yeah. If you believe that those things you say will come to pass, you'll have whatever you say. Amen. 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 Tomatoes are flying. I feel them in the spirit. Tomatoes are flying by. There, there's no, if when you read the Bible, there's no mystery that God thinks we have authority and power by the things we say. Amen. There's no mystery. If, you, if you're a Bible person, there's no mystery that God needs our heart and our mouth to work together to make Amen. miracles happen. Amen. Even the salvation miracle requires your heart and your mouth. Amen. No preacher can give it to you. No thinking real hard can cause it. No magic wand can give you salvation. The only way to get salvation is you've got to believe it in your heart and you must say it with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and then you shall be saved. The heart and the mouth have to be connected to make miracles. Your mouth makes miracles. Hallelujah. Anybody ever heard of Norval Hayes? Norval Hayes is one of our modern day pioneers of faith and uh, had lots of miracles happen, lots of great fruit from his ministry. He's still preaching the gospel. He does have to sit, sit in a chair to preach. I think he's in his high 80s right now, 87. And, uh, but this happened back in the 80s in Florida. He was a businessman as well as a preacher. And uh, there was coming a hard freeze in Florida. And that was a big deal to him because he owned several orchards. It, uh, it was either one big one or two adjacent orchards, orange orchards. And so the big news was that it's going to wipe out the Florida orange crop for the season. Well, he didn't want to lose his oranges, so he got in his car and drove over to his field, and he just spoke to his oranges. 
And he said, every orange out there, I command you to live and not die. Every tree, I command you to live and not die. And I rebuke the freeze, and all of this fruit's coming to me. Hallelujah. And he just put some words on the matter and spoke what's supposed to happen. Well... Sure enough, the freeze came and killed every single orange in the state, or at least the county. Everything froze from left to right, top to bottom, except his fields. And there was even a picture in the newspaper. This made it to the news. So much so that people wanted to go see and so they drove by. I told this story the first time several years in the church, uh, early, early on in the church, and uh, somebody was sitting in the congregation and said, I saw that. I drove by and saw it myself. <laughs> that his was the only fields that didn't die of the frost. Everybody else was spraying their trees with water. You know how you can protect it with ice. Uh, he didn't do anything to his, and his lived. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, miracles do happen. You might have to use your faith, though. Amen. You might have to use your faith to keep your harvest. Yes. So you've got to apply these type things. You hear a story like that, you need to get the Bible and apply it scripturally into your life. How, what could I say to help myself get a harvest? Well, you hear some bad news coming. You hear something that might not come through. You hear some dreadful thing that might come. What are you going to do with it? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, let's all pray. Yeah. How about let's all say? Amen. Amen. I'm not against prayer, but I'm for Jesus. Jesus didn't say pray real hard when you see the mountain. He said say to the mountain, be removed. Yeah. And so when you have a, a weird thing happen, say something to it. Yeah. Oh, 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 I wiped that out right now. Uh-uh, that, that ain't happening here. Amen. Amen. Lord. See, this is a more fun way to live, isn't it? Amen. If you're going to live with God, it might as well be fun. Amen. Jesus had no problem with fun. Matter of fact, he... Jesus expected things to be so fun that when he gave his, his disciples authority to go cast out devils, they all came back so happy and so rejoicing. And Jesus had to remind them, now don't be that happy. <laughs> Remember he said that? Yeah. Don't be happy that the demons, don't, don't rejoice so much that the demons are subject to you. Rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. So he had to calm people down. They were so happy. <clears throat> Turn with me. What got into me this morning? My wife just said, I don't know. <laughs> Second Kings, if you'll turn there, please. Second Kings chapter 3. So, good seed doesn't die. You got it? Amen. What that means is, when you're believing God or when you're going through your life and you're trying to, you're trying to get to the bottom of the bucket, <laughs> you know, we want to be running over the top of the bucket. With finance. But if you feel like you're not even at the bottom of the bucket, remember this. Good seed doesn't die. What that means is, and it means many things. You can apply it many ways. But it means not to get dumb words spoken in the house. Amen. Well, I just don't know what we're going to do. Right? Don't start pressuring God. All right? Don't start, now God, you know, you know the 29th is coming. You know, you know it's coming, God. Where, where's my harvest? I've got to have the harvest. Don't get all weird and bitter and grudging against God, so don't pressure God. God doesn't work well when you give Him a due date. He already knows the due date, okay? You don't have to, like, pull, pull that out. All the due date does is pressure you. When you get your calendar out to decide when the miracle has to happen, all it does is put a lot of pressure on you. What if it doesn't happen, right? So don't pressure God. Don't pressure people. Don't get so tight with money and start reasoning and working it out so hard and straining so hard that you put pressure on everybody else around you. You have to learn how to trust God and cast all your care upon God and be free and at peace and restful, even in circumstances. Number three, don't put pressure on yourself. Number four, uh, don't start making weird financial decisions out of fear. All right? Amen. We're moved by faith. We live by faith. We walk by faith. We do not walk by fear. We do not walk by emotion. We do not make our decisions based on senses. So don't get into weird financial stuff because of fear. All right? Well, I think I better sell the house because, you know, something's happening. Something's going to happen. Don't do it out of that. Amen. Get some faith before you make financial decisions. <clears throat> um, all right, 
Now I want to talk about a term called, uh, I call it daily harvest versus exceptional harvest. I think through our life we need faith for uh, natural living or we could say uh, normal living, normal life. And then we need faith for exception cases, emergencies, uh, big things, new things, uh, every once in a while, seasonal things. We need some extra money. So, but let's go with daily, daily living. I think we need a daily passive faith to sustain us. Like I need to be able to float on top of the water forever. Amen. No, no reason for the waves to go over my head and me bobbing back up and down. And, and so I'm happy and I'm in faith. And no, oh my gosh, God, help me, help me. Oh, oh, God, thank you, thank you. Help me, help me, help. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We need a daily faith to carry us through this life, right? And we do that by knowing our covenant with God, following these principles. Uh, you could anchor yourself to a few scriptures like, My God shall supply all of my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Yeah. Right? The young lions suffer lack, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Right? Or you can anchor yourself to Matthew chapter 6, which is our basic finance for the Christian chapter. Right? Do not worry. Don't take any thought about your heavenly Father's got it taken care of. He knows what you need. He'll supply it. You seek Him. Everything's added. So somehow that just sustains us through the whole thing, right? Every once in a while, though, you might need an exceptional harvest. You might need some big money, some miracle money, some emergency money, or some fun money. Yeah. You can use your faith for fun money, sure. Do it with the right heart. Don't covet things, sure. Uh, so... Let's talk about 2 Kings chapter 3 here. 2 Kings 3. This is when uh, three armies, Judah and Israel and the king of Edom, came together to fight the Moabites who, had, who, who were coming against Israel and Judah. And so they came and they were going out to battle, but they got on the battlefield didn't have any water. And so they're, now they're complaining and worried. Like, why do we come out? What have we done? You know, now we're just going to die out here. And so they said, wait a second. Is there a prophet maybe that could help us? Anybody heard from God? And somebody said, yeah, yeah, we know one. Uh, Elisha. They said, get him. So they brought Elisha in and they had the musician play. And the hand of the Lord came upon him as the music played. Verse 16. And, the, and he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet that the valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. Hallelujah. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. Hallelujah. So notice this picture here, okay? And this is what you need to realize about reaping by faith and using your faith to get your harvest. Remember I said it takes a little work. You notice we didn't just stand around and pray and twiddle thumbs. They needed help. The prophet heard from God. And God said, do something. Many times to get your harvest, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to hear from God. You're going to have to obey. You're going to have to believe. You're going to have to hear, believe, and obey. Amen? Notice what did God tell them to do? Work. Dig ditches. Why dig ditches? Because God needs a place to put the water. Amen. <laughs> That's why we discussed already. You know, if you're if you're wanting more finance to come in, if you're needing more money, if you're then then start a savings account. Why well, start a savings account if I don't have any money? So God can fill it. Glory. See, your faith and your work of faith has to happen before miracles happen. It's the trigger for the miracle. So God needed them involved in their miracle. Humans always have to get involved in miracles. Did you know that? For real miracles that are dramatic enough to be called a miracle, humans have always had to be involved. The splitting of the Red Sea, Moses had to stretch the rod. Yeah. 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 Think about it. Every single miracle in the Bible, a human had to get involved. Had to hear from God, had to believe God, had to obey God. And nothing's different with us. And so digging the ditch is like creating the business. Digging the ditch is like setting the plan to create the business. You've got to start with something. You've got to give God a place to put it. 
You've got to give God a reason to give the money. Yeah. 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 Notice he says, verse 17, You shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain. Yet the valley will be filled with water. So don't start figuring out how it's going to work. What if they woke up the next morning and looked up and, well, there's no clouds and there's no wind and there's no rain. How's God going to answer? That's not your business. You dig the ditch and stay faithful. Dig the ditch and stay expecting. Dig the ditch under the unction of the Holy Spirit and let God do the filling of it. Because He'll probably override whatever natural reasoning you figured it out. God will, maybe God will have someone knock at the door and give me money. That'll, now, now He can't use that one. See? See? <clears throat> One time I uh, got an exceptional harvest kind of accidentally. The seed grew faster than I expected. I was sitting in a church service and I'd been in these revival meetings for a number of weeks. And uh, when I wasn't preaching, I was in town in these revival meetings at night. And um, during the meeting, offering time came and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, uh, you know, I probably don't need to give anything because I've been giving a lot. Every night, I've been giving a lot for, for weeks now in this revival meetings. I've been giving plenty. You know, I don't really need to give. And I'm just kind of rehearsing this in my mind I'm, and I'm waiting for the offering to hurry and pass me by. I'm sure you've never done that, but. <laughs> and it passes you by and you're like, well, I couldn't make my decision up, so it's fine. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just expressing natural thinking, not spiritual thinking. But I am human, right? Okay, so uh, I'm sitting there and I'm going through this. I don't need to give. I've, I've given plenty. You know, it's no big deal. And all of a sudden I realize this is, I, I'm like talking with the devil here. Yeah. Yeah. This is not God trying to convince me not to give. This must be the devil. And it just, I thought that's it. That's it. I caught you, devil. I'm giving everything I've got in my pocket. Come on. And at the time I had, I reached in my pocket and I had four $20 bills, 80 bucks. And I said, that's it, I'm breaking your back, devil. You start messing with me, telling me not to do what's right, I'll just break you. And, and you need to do that sometimes in your life. You need to break the devil's back. If he's hounding you about a certain thing, do the opposite. Amen. Some people come to church saying, well, the devil's been after me all week. Just do the opposite. He's been trying to get me to, don't do it. And so I just broke the devil's back, threw my 80 bucks in, felt really good on the inside. Right? Just so happy and didn't have any money in my pocket. That, that's a good feeling sometimes if you've done it by faith. And I um, had the church service, and I was walking out after the church service. And some guy comes up and hugs me and uh, shakes my hand, and there's a little something in his hand. <laughs> you know, you got to be cool about it. I didn't want to like, look at it. So it was a check. And so I put it in my pocket and walk outside. And I get in my car and... <laughs> And it was a check for a thousand dollars. It was just just a little simple blessing, you know, just a little easy thing. You just walk with God, and things happen like that. Amen. You walk with God, and you keep your faith high, and you keep your principles going, you keep your bucket holes plugged, <laughs> and no telling what'll happen. Lord. <clears throat> Look at 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. This is where you, th you say, Thank God for America. Amen. The creditor's coming to take my two sons. So Elisha said to her, What, do I, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? So here you've got the man of God, you've got God apparently with him, and so a miracle is needed, isn't that right? Yeah. When a miracle needed, what do you think is the, the natural reaction of most people? When a miracle is needed, what do you usually do? We pray, right? But if you understand some things about miracles, you know that that's not the only step needed. I'm not against prayer. I'm just showing you that to get the miracle, there's one more step. Because there's a lot of people praying and don't get anything. Yeah, 
I see you're all enthused about that. Yeah. It's the truth, though. I just didn't, we can need to admit some truth around here. Christians need to admit some truth to themselves. Yeah. Notice what happened here. Elisha says, tell me, what do you have in the house? God is going to need you to give him something. You need a miracle, he's going to get something from you. And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Just a jar of oil. Give it to me. You're going to take her last bit of oil? Yeah, that's all God needs. Remember when Jesus had to feed the 5,000? Yeah. Jesus had to feed the 5,000. He says, what do we got? Well, we got a little lad here. He's got a few fishes, five loaves, three fishes, right? Five and two yeah. fishes. Oh, that's all I need. Just give me that. But that's all of his stuff. Just give it to me. I, God needs the seed before he can give the harvest. Yeah. Now, you can argue with, this about God, argue with God about this if you want to, but that's just his way. The kingdom of God is as if a man should cast seed into the ground. And so he's always going to look for what can you give in this. Give me some faith. Give me some seed. Give me some unction. Give me some action. Give me some obedience. Hear my voice. Work with me here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Come on. Amen. Yeah. Then he said, go. Borrow vessels from everywhere. From all your neighbors. Empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. Notice that he tells her to go borrow. Borrowing is not a sin. What is a sin is not paying back. Now, if you're in some chapter 11 trouble, I understand there's mercy and forgiveness, and if you can't pay it back, go plead for mercy, okay? So I'm not against that either. That's in the Bible. The year of release is in the Bible. The year of jubilee is in the Bible. After seven years, you, you, dis, you, you erase all the debt. That's in the Bible. So I'm not against chapter 11 or not paying back. But what is a sin is deciding not to pay back. Amen. The wicked, the Bible says, borrows and doesn't pay back. So you need to have a heart that really wants to pay back whether you can or not. So borrow vessels from everywhere, empty vessels. Don't gather just a few. And when you've come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. Then pour it, that little jar, into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and he poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Notice when the miracle ends. It's when your expectation ends. Notice when the miracle ends. It's when you don't have another ditch or another vessel. When does God stop filling your savings accounts when you don't have another one? When does God stop filling seats in a church when you don't add them? Yeah. 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 Good. yeah. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. The point is, if you want extra money, you're going to have to plan something extra. Okay? If you want extra money to come to you, you have to plan something extra. You have to be willing to grow. You have to be willing to increase. You have to uh, get another invention. Start another franchise. Increase, increase, increase requires your plans. All right? Hallelujah. When I was um, <clears throat> first in the Lord, maybe my third year, second, third year in the Lord, I needed some extra money. Now, I'd already left my career. I'm, I'm volunteering at a church. Income is almost nil. I'd given all my cash away. Income is not there. Uh, so I was just having to trust God from day to day and loving it, just loving it. I was establishing this relationship with God, my Father. And it was glorious. And I have lots of little stories. And just I remember the feeling was just so free, so free and glorious. But anyway... Uh, I remember my first big need that came up. My best friend from college was getting married, and I was in the wedding, and I needed to get a tux, I needed to buy a wedding present, and I needed to uh, buy a round of golf, because that was the bachelor party. Well, that was the, they were doing two parts. They were playing golf and going out at night, and so I just, the Christian, I just did the golf. <laughs> and so... I calculated, I said, I said, okay, I need $134. And so I asked God, God, I need $134 in Jesus' name. And that was it. 
That was the first, that week, that was the first time I ever got money in the mail. And a, a letter came in, and it was from a cousin, actually. And it was a $50 bill with no note. $50 cash sent in the mail. And I don't know how I got the rest of the money, but I just remember thinking, God has sent me money. All right? Well, the next time I got money in the mail, I needed $508. This was a ministry trip. I had a ministry summer planned. I had to preach in uh, Texas in a couple places. But in between, I was asked to go work in New York and New Jersey for R.W. Schambach's Tent Crusades, the Healing Crusades. And so I was trying to juggle this, and I'm a little, uh, little concerned. I don't know what to do. I'm confused. You know, I got these obligations here. I don't know if I want to spend that much time up there. And so I began to pray in the Spirit and pray in the Spirit. And I just remember walking around and praying in the Spirit. And all of a sudden, I knew. God said, do it all. I said, okay. See, doing things by faith, reaping harvest by faith, means you do need to be in the will of God. Yeah. You do need to be in the plan of God. We don't just get to say, I think I'm going to go to that city and buy and sell and make gain. James says, don't do that. What you ought to say is, if the Lord will, you'll go to that city and make gain. And so I had got the will, I got the plan of God, got the will of God, knew what to do. And so I began to, to calculate, okay, well, here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fly to Tulsa, and then I'm going to drive with my partner, Angelo, to New York. Then I'm going to fly home in the middle and fly back. So I can preach here and then fly back between the two crusades, 10-day crusades. And then when I get done, I'm going to take a bus ride back home to Houston <laughs> from New York City. And just to tell you the funny part, the, the, bus, you know, the bus ride, and it wasn't so because I was cheap. What, I, what, had, what had happened is I had been studying some of the pioneers of faith like Charles Finney and John Wesley and some of these old timers who uh, they, they could only use trains to get around, you know, basically, or horse and buggy. And um, so they would go from town to town in these trains trying to get somewhere. And in every train station, they would stop and preach the gospel and revival would happen. Sometimes they just skip the bride because the revival happened. I'm thinking, man, that'd be fun. I just, I just stand up and start preaching the gospel in <laughs> multitudes. And so I did. I scheduled it and I, and I booked it. And uh, needless to say, uh, I don't recommend that in this modern day. <laughs> in the old days, it seemed like you'd get a crowd doing anything. In this modern day, uh, it turned out that I think by the end of the trip, just before I got to Houston... Uh, before the final turn to the bus station, I finally witnessed to the person next to me in the seat. It was nothing like I had imagined, so it was a big waste of time. But it was part of my trip, so I, had, I needed to schedule these plane tickets and bus tickets and all that, so I calculated it was $508 that I needed. And I, and I wrote it down, and I, and I made the phone calls, and I said, Okay, God, I need $508. I ask you for it in Jesus' name. Thank you for it. And I was real happy, you know. I knew that When you're in the will of God, things just feel so good, don't they? And uh, about 15 minutes later, as my custom was at home, I went out to the mailbox and uh, got the mail, brought it in, and there's an envelope for me in there from somebody that's never sent me an envelope before. And inside the envelope was a check for $500. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there was a note in it, and it said, Chas, uh, thank you for helping my son. I had ministered a little bit to a, a friend of our son. And uh, it said... I just wanted to send you this money for some place you might be wanting to visit this summer. She didn't have a clue what she's saying, right? And uh, so God had the money prepared for me before I even said amen. She had to do this a couple days before to get it to me, right? So you have to realize that God does this behind the scenes, underground stuff. You don't need to know about all that. But He does know if you're going to be in faith or not. He does know, he, he did know days before, years before, thousands of years before, he knew that I was going to find the will of God, act on the will of God, trust him for the money, ask him for the money, and not worry. Yes. And so the money was there. But you've got to follow those steps. You've got to have it spiritually set before God, because he knows if you're going to be spiritually set next week when you need the miracle. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Hallelujah. Some, somebody's probably thinking, well, what about the eight? How come it wasn't $508? <laughs> because I had $8. Yeah. You old hyper-spiritual folks, you. 
Yeah, like the video we saw. You, you might be oversaved if that's what you were thinking. You might be oversaved if someone buys a dirt devil and you cast the devil out of it. <laughs> and then the next... See, these are... These are I needed ministry money, and, and before I needed fun money, right? I just needed social uh, friendship money. So God's, He's okay with both of those, isn't He? He's okay with uh, car money, television money. He's okay with stuff, all right? Just do it with a right heart and a right motive, and don't ask amiss, and don't consume it upon your lust, and don't be worldly. And, you know, you've got to put it all together. Amen. Uh, the next time, I'll tell you this one, I was um, asked to go to Kenya, Africa, Preached the gospel for a week there in a, in a conference. And I'd never been overseas, and I wasn't opposed to overseas, but I had a lot of obligation in the, in the U.S. and uh, wanted to make sure it was the will of God. And so I turned this guy down three times, I think. And then finally he asked me again, and that night I, I, big, I went, went outside to pray. And I was at my house just walking through the neighborhood and praying at night, just praying in tongues and praying in tongues and praying in tongues and praying in tongues. You know, that's how you... Figure out the will of God. You've got to pray in tongues. If you're not sure, if you don't have an unction, you better pray until you get an unction. You better pray in the Spirit until you know in the Spirit what to do. I call it chopping trees. You've got to chop trees through that forest so you can see clearly. Hallelujah. And praying in tongues, every, time you, every minute you pray in tongues is like chopping another tree. And uh, somebody says, how long you got to do that? Until the trees are chopped. That's how long. <laughs> and so I just did that. And I was praying in tongues. And, and I walked and, and, and walked about 30 minutes away from the house. Probably took me an hour or so. Uh, you know, meandering around, and after about an hour of praying in tongues, I realized, wow, the whole time I've been praying about Kenya. I didn't even really realize it. And I thought, wow, I'd already prayed myself there and back. And I thought, looks like I'm going to Kenya. Felt right. I said, glory to God. Thank you, Lord. So for the next 30 minute walk back home, I'm just thanking the Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to Kenya. This will be exciting. And I began to think about my trip and all the stuff that I had going on here. And I got almost to, the, to my house, almost back to my house, and I thought, oh, man, I need money. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, he told me the plane tickets are approximately such and such, so I need this and I need that and I need this. Okay, God, I need $1,800. And I heard his voice. He said, no, you need $2,500. Yeah. And I said, okay, I need $2,500. I ask you for $2,500. See how God works with us? Why did He just ignore what I was saying and give me $2,500? <laughs> because He wants us to be in an active conversation, an active dialogue, an active life with Him. Yeah. That's what the walk of faith... That's the most exciting part of the walk of faith. Yeah. Money's not the end exciting part. What's exciting is knowing that God worked with you through it. Yeah. And uh, I said, okay, I need $2,500 in Jesus' name. Amen. And I was happy. Went to bed. Didn't even think about it again. Next morning was Sunday morning. We got up, went to church, my home church, sitting in church and having a good time. Didn't even think about the money. At the end of the church service, a brother in the church comes up to me and he says, uh, hi, Chaz, you, you believe in God for some money? And it dawned on me I was. I thought, yeah, sure, I sure I am. He said, what do you need it for? I said, I said, I'm going to Kenya. He said, how much do you need? I said, $2,500. He said, I'll be right back. He went and talked to his wife, brought me back a $2,500 check. That's quick harvest, didn't it? This is exceptional harvest, but you have to realize something. You have a harvest field out there right now that's ripe. So anything that you need, you can go get it. You just have to do it in faith. You have to do it by unction of the Spirit. You have to hook up with God in the matter. Yes. Isn't that exciting? Now, I just thank God that He was in the Spirit too. Yes. That's one reason to hang out with Spirit-filled people. Yes. Yeah, you need to hang out with Spirit-filled Christians. Did you realize that? There's safety and protection and blessing hanging out with Spirit-filled believers. I'm not putting down other Christians. I'm not putting down other people necessarily. But you need to recognize who your company is. You need to be with people that know God. You need to be rubbing shoulders with people that can sharpen you. You need that. Weekly, weekly, weekly. In the Bible, it was daily, daily, daily. I mean, now that with Facebook, you can be with your Christian friends daily, right? 
He used Facebook in his message. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll, this will be our final scripture, I believe. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The, the, point, the point here is you're going to have to give God a reason to give you more money. Amen. All right? Everybody wants to increase to some degree just because it feels right, but you're going to have to give God a, God a reason. You're going to have to give Him a, an invention, a design. You have to create something. You've got to set the plan, right? If you had the money right now, what would you use it for? For the kingdom. He's ready for the kingdom. Yeah. You can use it for all sorts of things. You can add to the kingdom. You give it to the church building fund. You could put it in savings for your kid's college. Uh, you could buy something with it. You could start on your lake house fund. Yes. It's okay to have a lake house or a beach house. Sure. Amen. Sure. Keep it in perspective. But it's, it's good to start having a plan. Start working towards something. Amen. You understand? It, the, what happens is because we're so pessimistic... That we think in our minds, well, if I had $50,000, I could buy something. I could start a this. I could, then I'll open an, an investment account. But you're not really expecting it. You don't know what investment account. You, don't know, you haven't picked a mutual fund. You don't know what lake or what beach you might want to be at. And so really, if you're going to get God involved, the, the timing has to match the miracle money. And so you might even have to set a date and set a time and set an approximation of, I'm going to start working towards this because I feel like in the Spirit this is the right thing to do for us and we're going to start our own business one day. And when you start getting the plan going and praying it through and praying it through and praying it through and the money's it'll be there when you're ready. Amen. We've learned that here at the church that you know we can sit there all day long thinking, well, if we had enough money, we could do the such and such. And before, you know, there was a time when we, it was just Joni and I at the church. And we were the only office personnel. We did everything there was to do. And, uh, you know, from the sweeping to the technical stuff to the graphics to the, you know, banking, whatever. We did it all. And we started realizing, man, we, we need help. We just can't do what we need to do here at the church and, and really be the pastors we need to be. And so we need to hire somebody. And it was this, you know, this short conversation of, and we don't necessarily have enough money. <laughs> you know, th that thought goes on in your mind. <laughs> and you learn real quick, if you're going to walk by faith, you've got to stop that. Amen. And so we realized and made the decision, wait a second, we need an assistant. We're going to hire an assistant and God will pay for it. Glory. Yeah. We hired an assistant and God paid for it day one. Glory. And never, we never missed a bill. Then we needed to hire a second person a couple years later. A second person. But we really need something. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. We're going to hire somebody right now. God will pay for it. Amen. Day one, week one, month one. I started, I've watched it happen so often. Now I know. I, it's almost like before we even make the decision, I'm thinking ahead thinking, oh, we're going to have more money in the church by next month because I just know how God does it. I'm not pessimistic anymore. I'm not grumbling and worried anymore. I know how God does this stuff. When you create a ditch, when you set a right need with a right unction of the Spirit, then God always meets it. How, how can I say that? Because the Bible says it. I'm not just going off experience. He said, my God shall supply all my need. According to His riches, not mine. In glory by Christ Jesus. This is a fun way to live. And I just thank God that, it, that He let me in. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 here. When we moved in this building, do you realize when we moved in this building, we were operating at a financial level about right here, and you know, we had a little bit, little bit more than we needed. But when we got this building, our rent multiplied three times. I think it was from 2,500 to 7,500 for year one. Then year two was another 2,500 added. And then the year, because we had a, we set a graduated pay scale. Three times the amount of money. Day one, we had the money. We, the day we moved in here, we had the money. 
Not even before. You have to realize that God doesn't put the stone under your foot until you step. God didn't part the Red Sea until they stepped in it. God didn't part the River Jordan until the priest went out there with the Ark of the Covenant. You've got to start before you know. That's called walking by faith. You've got to take the step before all the details are ironed out. Amen. The details have to be ironed out in your heart, in the Spirit. You have to know that you know that you know from God by the Holy Spirit before you start making moves. Don't run around and start you know, being presumptuous about everything. Amen. I mean, God might you know, cover some of your ignorance, but I can't promise He'll cover all of it. <laughs> Bottom line is hook up with the Holy Spirit and make your decisions in the Spirit, and then God will supply it's just how he is. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 here, verse 6, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. So let each one of us give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. If you're ever sitting there feeling like you're getting manipulated or coerced into giving money, don't. Don't feel that way. Don't feel that way and don't give if you do. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, Amen. that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to read the rest. As it's written, He has dispersed abroad, He's given to the poor, His righteousness endures forever. Now may He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Praise God. Hallelujah. Notice verse 8. He's able to make all grace abound towards you. He'll give you all the ability, provision, and everything necessary when you start doing things in the will of God this way. That you always having all sufficiency in all things. Now wouldn't that be a good testimony for you? As a matter of fact, everybody say it. Say, I... I always, always have all sufficiency, have all sufficiency in, all in all things. No matter what my history says. All sufficiency. N never again do you have to say or think, well, we don't have enough money. We've already been through that. That was lesson two. You don't have to say that. Okay? Change your mindset until things catch up with you. You don't have to live that way. You don't have to worry about zero in the bank. But it has to change here first. It has to start on the inside. So you're going to always have all sufficiency. And if that hasn't been how it's been for you, then you need to get this scripture out and quote it, you know, maybe a thousand times. <laughs> I don't know, maybe go 1,500 times. Maybe quote it until it works. Maybe quote it until it gets in your heart. That's how you take the Word of God and start believing it. Because until you believe the Scripture, it won't work for you. So you've got to plant this in you until your heart sees it so clearly that it makes your mouth smile. But notice this final part. You always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance of... Why? For every good work. Amen. I'll end with this. T somehow tie your needs to purpose. Amen. Somehow we're, we're in the worldly rut sometimes of buying li liabilities. More wealth is not so you can make more purchases. More wealth is so that you can fulfill more purpose. Amen. Look at money as a tool to accomplish something for God, for your family, for your ch children, your grandchildren, for your neighbor, for society. Look at more wealth as a tool to fulfill your purposes. Because when you get to heaven, that's, you, you can't take all the stuff with you. What you can take is obedience to the will of God and a fulfilled, purposeful life. So keep in mind that more wealth is for you to fulfill more purpose. Amen? All right. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. 
Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world, helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ, and building strong Christians who can impact their world, and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs, or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online, by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas, and looking for a good home church, Pastor Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. To watch services via live streaming, or for more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web, or download our Houston Faith phone app, or catch our Houston Faith TV Roku channel. 